Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. La ilaha illallah. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Wa naqibatu lil muttaqeen. Wa salatu wa salamu ala shakil anbiya wal mursaleen. نبينا ومولانا محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين. Respected elders, respected brothers, dear friends, mothers, sisters, and beloved viewers, we are very fortunate today, alhamdulillah, that uh, I like to bring about certain expertise. When I say expertise, it's it's very subjective. Well, my understanding of expertise are those who are passionate and on the ground and most importantly have experienced it. Because it's very easy to paint a picture when it's theory. It's very easy to paint a picture when it's theory. But the reality is that you can only paint a picture once you've lived and experienced it. And that's why wisdom comes with age. Is that there's a certain amount of years that gives you a certain... Uh, a certain niche, a certain expertise. It's like you know, sometimes you come into the mechanics and the car's making a certain noise. And he's never seen the car before, neither has he inspected the car. But th just through the noise, he can tell you that it sounds like your gearbox is going. Now, he's not a magician. But through his experience of dealing with gearboxes, he, can, he picks up a trend that a certain noise has a certain effect. So with our community in today's time, Alhamdulillah, Allah has you know, given us some type of experience. And I like that the Jumu'ah podium be shared amongst the community so that we can have a broader, better understanding of the world. And perhaps inshallah ta'ala, the more broader that we can understand, empathize and sympathize with the world, the more we can come close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by loving His creation unconditionally. Today, alhamdulillah, my respected brothers and elders, I have a guest speaker today. He is no stranger to the community, especially to the community of North Lakes. He's been giving Jumu'ah there. He is a doctor by trade. And alhamdulillah, he has experienced, he has experienced first-hand in South Africa, what it means to be a person who is third class. What it means to be a person that is basically dealt with double standards. And what is going out, what is going around the world in the Uyghur community amongst the Chinese and the Rohingyans amongst the Burmese. And we see what is happening with the Afghans in Pakistan. And we see what is happening, especially with the Palestinians in Palestine. I thought that this will be a relevant topic for us here in Australia that can only but imagine what they're going through to try and empathize and sympathize with our brothers and Muslims around the world. So today, inshallah, in a very short time, Dr. Harun, inshallah ta'ala, will be sharing with us some of his experience in South Africa in regards to this very unhumane, unjust system of the apartheid. Dr. Saab, Falatu Faddal. I bear witness that there is none worthy of worship except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is the messenger and worshipper. <clears throat> Dear brothers, elders and sisters, thank you very much Imam Ikram for inviting me to speak today. I am truly honoured yet humbled to address you on this very special day of Juma in the special house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala here at Bald Hills Masjid. I will start off with this verse from Surah Ali Imran. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Kuntum khayra ummatin ukhrijat lin nas, ta'muruna bil ma'urufi wa tanhuna amun munkari wa tu'minun billah. You are now the best people for, brought forth for the guidance and reform of mankind. You enjoy what is right and you forbid what is evil and you believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
Imam asked me to speak to you about Palestine and the sufferings of our fellow Muslims. Now, I've never been to Palestine and I don't have first-hand account of their sufferings, but I do have first-hand experience of a word or a system that is often used to describe their plight. Apartheid. In the light of my country, South Africa, being the lone voice to stand up for the Palestinians in, on an international forum, I thought I'd explain to you about apartheid. It was all about how it affected people, and I will give you some of my own personal and family experiences of life under apartheid. Yes, the infamous word has its origins in South Africa. Now, racism existed in many parts of the world. In the USA, <clears throat> there was racism in the Deep South. England had, had its troubles with the Irish based on racial and religious uh, grounds. Earlier, the Indian, Indian subcontinent was trying to liberate itself from colonial rule. And let's face it, in the past, things were not rosy for people of color in Australia. The difference about South Africa is that the government was bold and brazen enough to call it as it is, apartheid, racism. We want to keep the races separate, and it literally means separateness. It is a system of nationalized racial segregation. The white minority government was in power, and they set about a legal and political framework to manage and retain most of the country's resources and to remain in power. Once the machinery of apartheid was in motion, the government was very hard on anyone challenging its status. Note that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala addresses all of humanity in the following verse of Surah Hujra, and I'll give you the translation. O oh, human beings, Ya Ayyuan Nas, we created you all from a male and a female and made you into nations and tribes so that you may know each other. Verily, the noblest of you in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is those who have taqwa. And surely Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is all knowing and all aware. <clears throat> Vibrant, thriving communities were uprooted and displaced. Homes were demolished and belongings were just thrown aside. Black people had their citizenships of South Africa revoked and they moved to homelands. These were pockets of land away from the cities, which had no real sovereign status. They needed to carry passes on them to identify them wherever they went and whenever they moved out of their enclaves. There was an entire province or an entire state that was out of bounds with people of color. Doesn't this sound all too familiar for what's happening in Palestine? Then there was petty apartheid. Restaurants, hotels, schools, hospitals, beaches, cinemas, public transports, restrooms, even park benches were allocated for the different race groups. It was illegal to marry outside your race group. I was born into the system when apartheid was well and truly established. We lived in separate communities and public places were separate. Observely, even the queues at the post office and the banks were separate. I recall many times that we were given that awful look and that awful stay and we would even be called derogatory names if we found ourselves in the wrong place. I also recall the police coming to our house, searching the place, questioning my parents and then just leaving without any explanation. Teachers lost their jobs or were reassigned if they were too active or too vocal against apartheid. And as much as we loved sports, there was no chance that you could play on a national or an international level. To be honest with you, as a young girl, I had little interest in politics. I went to school, I attended Madresa, I played backyard cricket and soccer with my brother and my friends. I had yo-yo in my pocket and those few coins that I had, I'd waste on the Pac-Man game. And my parents were contented with that. They just wanted us to live a normal life, as normal as possible, staying in our lane, swimming with the current and not getting into too much of trouble with the authorities. 
But the media was heavily controlled by the government. We knew of the sufferings of people in the townships. Riots, detention without trial, spying, suspicion, collaboration, murder, killings, pandemonium at times. Life was short, life was cheap, and life was difficult. <clears throat> when I was accepted at university, my parents sat down with me and, he, and they had a long, hard chat. They said I should make the most of the half chance that I got because they did not get the same opportunity. <clears throat> he advised me not to do two things. Just don't get involved with a girl and get into a relationship and don't get into politics. And I asked him for forgiveness because I disobeyed him on one of those two points. But there is a good explanation. <clears throat> there was also a very good reason for his fears though. People in our community disappeared if the government viewed them as a threat. Imprisoned, tortured, exiled, and some, some didn't even make it alive. When the bodies were returned to their families, they were given up a trumped up explanation. He had an accident, he had a fight, he fell down the stairs, he had committed suicide, but the injuries never matched the explanation. It was obviously that they were murdered in captivity. <clears throat> I dabbled in politics only because I was part of an Islamic society at university. The Muslims were a minority and I felt duty bound to help. Initially helping with simple duties like the upkeep of the prayer area, arranging Jumma speakers and advocating for the Muslim students. But the Islamic society was part of a broader student rep council and the SRC was strongly politicized, strongly politically inclined. So we supported their boycotts, their rallies, their demonstrations in the name of Islam and to maintain our existence on campus. In fact, my first experience with tear gas was at an Al-Quds rally in Durban, protesting against a diplomat visiting South Africa. Tear gas, water cannons, batons were a sign that the police had actually toned down because it was rubber bullets and it was live ammunition in the past. On the other end of the city of Durban, my brother and my cousin were studying law, they were law students and they were very much into human rights. They attended clandestine meetings. They had close encounters with police at checkpoints. They took part in rallies and marches as well, risking much for a cause that they believed in. Eventually, when the first democratic election took place, there was some relief and joy, but there was an air of concern and worry and uncertainty because of a potential civil war. I thought I would never complete my studies. <clears throat> now, if you look back at the recent COVID pandemic, where there were lockdowns, supermarket wipeouts, these have triggered memories of times in South Africa, when there was a state of emergency, when there were curfew, the government was well armed and they were well experiencing military ways, but the opposing party were trained in African countries and they wanted revenge. Minority groups feared being brushed aside and people armed themselves and learned self-defense. With the grace of Almighty Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, disaster was averted. Nelson Mandela and Mr. F.W. declared found a path to a delicate peace and justifiably won the Nobel Peace Prize. But in truth, many lives were lost in faction fighting and ethnic violence that had occurred. There was a beautiful country that was well run and that was up for grabs. Brothers and elders, I will go on to just explain to you how apartheid came to an end. There were regular marches, protests, civil disobedience from the oppressed masses making the country very difficult to run. People called out for their freedom and self-determination. This is a basic human right. There was strong pressure from the international community as well. Boycott in South African products, disinvestment, isolation from sports, culture and entertainment. Large companies abandoned South Africa and everyone felt the pinch. Whenever my father rose up to Manson's job, he held, 
the company would relocate and roll or close down, and often he had to start up again. We had seen hard times. <coughs> but incredibly, during the hardest time around election, my parents did their contrib contribution. People came knocking to our door asking for help, and my parents rose to the occasion. They kept giving, and when he realized the scale of the problem, my father rallied unconcerned members of the community, contacted businesses, retailers, and individuals, arranged food hampers, and distributed hundreds every week. No matter how much I give in charity today, I won't be able to match my father in generosity and sincerity. It's because he gave when times were the hardest, and he gave for no personal gain. Those who, for the love of him, feed the needy, the orphan, and the captive, and they say, we feed you only for Allah's sake. We seek not any recompense or thanks. There are many more stories of great compassion, generosity, and kindness through the darkest days of apartheid. Many Muslim charitable organizations started up, extend, extending the help well beyond the South African borders. The default setting of mankind is goodness. That is why it's called humanity. Never let any person, any group, any ideology or shaitan influence you from that innate good that is within you. Moving on, it is also important to remember that there is a call from within the white community, those who realize the folly of apartheid, a call to dismantle the system. A referendum was held and it was eventually a yes vote, a mandate for the government to follow a path of unified rule. This is what we need regarding the Palestinian problem that reasonable, sensible people from all walks of life stand up against tyranny and injustice in spite of the apathetic or inactive politicians or governments. Dear fellow Muslims, I'm not too far from finishing up, but I hope you can bear with me for just one or two more points. You may find this strange for me to say, but I'm glad that I had seen such a thing as apartheid. From a young age, I realized that life is not perfect. It's not about rainbows and unicorns. Yet, I still had a happy childhood, and I'm very grateful for that. There was a strong community spirit in South Africa like no other, and I was not short of friends. When I see Palestinian lives snuffed out in an instant and children robbed of their childhood, it really breaks my heart. More especially because of the line of work that I am, that I am in, because it regards all life as valuable. The many religious groups lived in harmony. There was a lot of respect for people's beliefs, and there was a common enemy which we all united against. Our ulama tread a cautious line, and in hindsight, it was a very good line of action. The authorities would have clamped high on them. So, um, so just to uh, announce, turn to Corona 925WEM, uh, white Corona hatchback, the window is left open and it's raining, so anyone that owns that vehicle, turn to Corona 925WEM, the window is open. Sorry, Dr. I will try to cautious line and in hindsight it was a good line of action because the authorities we have climbed hard on them, and the hard work of our predecessors who built Masajid and Madaris would have been undone. Apartheid taught us to think critically beyond the media, beyond the propaganda, and beyond popular thought and culture. When you've taken to the streets for your freedom, you value it so much more. And when you see others suffer, you can empathize with them. This perhaps is the reason for South Africans, South Africa's action in the International Court of Justice. A point to note is that the apartheid government in South Africa just wanted complete control, but they had no intentions to eradicate any ethnic groups. So what our brothers and sisters in Palestine are now going through is apartheid at a higher level, at a different level. 
That's genocide. I'm glad that I've seen apartheid because I've given the opportunity to forgive. I bear no grudge on anyone. I don't hold the current generation accountable for the actions of the predecessors. In fact, it's the opposite of grudge. I have good will and I have hope for prosperity and peace for everyone in South Africa. And that's all the same for Australia, my new country. And I regard all Muslims as my people. South Africa still has challenges ahead. And I pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brings about just and sincere rulers, not just in South Africa, but in all our countries that we have left behind. And being under the yoke of oppression, I will make sure that I will never become an oppressor. No prejudice, no ill feelings, and no harm to anyone. Some have suffered more than others during apartheid. Many have much more sorrowful stories to tell, and others have been have given the ultimate sacrifice of their lives. But I'm sure that every South African would agree on one thing, that apartheid made you feel like a lesser human, only because of the circumstances you were born in. And apartheid should never ever be repeated in any part of the world. Brothers and elders, stand up against injustices of all types, whether it is in your home, or the office, the school ground, or halfway around the world. Just be good to people. You never know who have been through a hard time, or who is going through a hard time. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Barat, لَقَدْ خَلَقْنَا إِنْسَانَ فِي كَبَرْ Verily, we have created man in toil and hardship. So our mission in life is to be patient in suffering and to uplift, assist, and care for others. Our brethren in Palestine need us most. Boycott businesses that support the aggressive regime. Pressurize your government authority to act. Attend rallies and marches. Give charity. Help rebuild communities. Help rebuild families. Men, help men with broken bodies. Help men with broken hearts. Dua is a weapon of believer. Have sincere faith and most importantly, remember them in your du'as because du'a is a weapon of the believer. Have sincere faith and tawakkul in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He is the best of planners. He gives power to whomsoever he wishes and he takes back the power from whoever he wants to. And he has sovereignty over everything. When my eyes eventually close and I leave this world, I hope that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who is Ar-Rahman and who is Ar-Rahim, raises me and counts us amongst the oppressed people. We see such bravery, patience, steadfastness amongst the Palestinians and all those oppressed. They will surely be in a high standing in the day of Qiyamah. I am grateful to the Almighty for everything that has happened in my life and when, I, when, when you look back, there is always a good reason for everything. I can surely say that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has helped me and my countrymen during trying times and He will never abandon us or anyone. So I close with this dua from Yusuf alayhi salam. After all the trials and tribulations that he had undergone, he had showed such patience and gratitude to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Fatira samawati wa ard, anta waliyi fi dunya wa akhirah. O Creator of heavens and earth, you are my guardian in this world and in the hereafter. Cause me to die in submission to you and join me in the end with the righteous. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala increase the status of the, all those who have lost their lives unjustly. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala assist all those going through personal and collective hardship. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala assist those uh, people, all of the people of Palestine and everywhere else in the world. Jazakallah khair. Barakallahu feekum. Jazakallah kulla khair. Dr. Harun, those are words that were inspiring and I learned a lot even though I lived half my life and studied in South Africa and felt the end result of apartheid studying in 1996 even though the apartheid was finished it, the concept was still there the, 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 the after effects, the ripple effects of an apartheid is something that psychologically through um, through decades it still filters in the system and that is why I never judge a person 
never ever been into the person because we don't know what an individual has gone through. And that is what Islam is all about. That ibadah, worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, is understanding His creation. Don't be too fast to point a finger at anyone. إِيَّاكَ وَضَنُ إِنَّ بَعْدَ ضَنِّ إِثْمُونَ But Allah Ta'ala makes it very clear as He warns when a person warns another from a lion that's about to attack. We say, إِيَّاكَ وَالْأَسَدْ We say, watch out lion. Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala uses the same, same wording. He says, إِيَّاكَ وَضَنُ إِنَّ بَعْدَ ضَنِّ إِثْمُونَ That avoid suspicion. Avoid judging people. In the Ba'd al-Dhan, if the majority of your judgment is wrong, and it is a sin by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that Allah gives us understanding, has this love and this passion and this pain in our heart, that we do something for our brothers and sisters in the world, that we do not stand on their qiyamah as the role, that a big sign of selfishness, all they worried about was their family and their wealth, and their fast cars and their beautiful houses, and as long as I was well, then to the world they can go and fly a kite. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that this beautiful condition that He has put us in, in Australia, it's not going to be against us on the day of Qiyamah because we did not take a stance in the direction of worrying about those who have been trialed and tested until this time. In fact, our test is that in this comfortable environment that we live, what are we going to do? If we complain, may Allah forgive us. If we are going to make a change, what changes are we doing to help our brothers and sisters around the world? Thank you, Dr. Saab. I appreciate it, inshallah. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to guide us all, protect us. We ask Allah ta'ala to increase us in iman, increase us in taqwa, increase us in love and care in a time that they are all means to connect as human beings. Never like before when you had to send a, 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 a telegraph or a, or a letter and it took three months to get your letter. Today it's only but a message. As fast as you are messaging, the, the message is being received. But never have we seen mankind so, so apart, so disheveled, so angry with one another. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, remember the only thing that can unite human beings is Iman. And so we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to unite our hearts. Wa akhiru da'wana. Alhamdulillah rabbil alameen.